Hi, good evening, folks. We'll just wait a while. I see a few more people joining us. So we have the regular fan followers, I would say, for our COVID-19 circuit breaker webinar talks. I hope all of you are well at home, keeping safe, keeping healthy. Stay away from the crowds. Stay home, stay safe. We still have the Q&A at the end of the session, so feel free to type your questions. We'll take as many questions as possible. Good evening all, and thanks for following up with us. Today is our session four, part four of our COVID-19 Surviving Circuit Breaker. Today we have Dr. Bias Prasad, our in-house resident ENT surgeon, head and neck surgeon. Um, he's also a pediatric otolaryngologist. So um, any of you out there with children, feel free to ask all the questions you need about allergies and common flus. Um, we'll have him live soon, so stay tuned with us. And for all my Indonesian patients, thank you for joining us faithfully. I see you there, Papa Stanley. Thank you. Just give it a couple more minutes. We're waiting for more attendees to come in.
Hi, Dr. Vyas. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Hi, Lavinia. Can you Hi, hear me? Hi, good evening, Doc. I think good we have our regular follower fans and all our patients there. Okay. Um, the dinner, all relaxed and looking forward to your talk. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Shall we start? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, very, very good evening to one and all. And thank you so much for joining us for the fourth supplement of our webinar. Uh, and uh, my name is Vyas Prasad, I'm an ENT surgeon, and uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some common uh, ear, nose, and throat conditions. Uh, of course, uh, we'll touch on viral infections since uh, uh, we are witnessing a pandemic with the COVID-19 virus at this juncture, and uh, also talk about conditions that can possibly uh, mimic aspects of COVID-19 infection, but not uh, entirely the same as the infection itself. So uh, the uh, uh, ear, nose and throat is a part of the uh, human body that is uh, often the portal for many infections, uh, be they viral, bacterial, fungal, and uh, it's also a part of the body where we uh, uh, breathe in or swallow or, in, uh, or ingest uh, all sorts of uh, environmental allergens, pollutants, etc. So the uh, picture on the left-hand side is a uh, a picture of the COVID-19 virus. There are many other viruses, the common cold, for instance, uh, the standard flu virus that we're usually uh, used to, certainly in uh, the Western world and winter seasonal viruses, etc. And then the picture on the right hand side are the common allergens that uh, most human beings who suffer from conditions such as allergic rhinitis are prone to uh, um, get. Uh, so in the West, uh, pollen is quite common, certainly in countries uh, with uh, seasonal uh, characteristics and temperate climates, pollen, different types of grass, etc. And then, of course, in, in the tropics, as in, in everywhere else, we have uh, dust mite allergy. And then, of course, for those who are working uh, closely with animals or have animals as pets, you can also inhale various uh, components of their saliva or their fur, etc., and that can drive an allergic reaction. So both the viruses and the allergens go through the nose, can also go through the mouth, uh, and actually the eyes, but I will not uh, be spending too much time on the eyes today, and uh, they cause various reactions. So first and foremost, what's the difference between uh, cold uh, versus uh, a flu, well, the flu or influenza, which is the uh, correct term, uh, tends to affect not just the nose or the throat or, the, uh, or um, the chest, but it also causes other systemic effects. You get an ache all over your body, you get a headache, fatigue, and uh, if this progresses, it can affect your lungs. So the flu is a viral infection. You can't see viral infections. And uh, uh, they are dependent on their host to survive. So when a virus infects your body, it requires your body's cells to survive. It, it enters the cell and then uses your body's cellular features to reproduce and then carry on damaging the rest of the area that it has infected. So for instance, if you have a cold virus, uh, it enters via the nose and then it goes through the lining of the nose. This is called the mucosa. And after that, as it binds to a particular receptor, it, it manages to enter the cell and uses very cleverly the cell's own uh, technology to reproduce itself. So this is what it does. And in the process, it kills the cell. Or if you stretch the uh, characteristics any further, then you probably also damage the lining of the nose or the throat or the lung. So uh, it comes from the word to influence, it's from the Latin. There are several types of influenza viruses and they are invariably airborne. So if you were to cough, sneeze, 
or speak very uh, forcefully or sing possibly, you could also get a bout of the flu. And uh, as I mentioned before, there are yearly outbreaks and uh, this is often at the time of uh, the winter seasons in, uh, in temperate climates. And this is why we uh, tend to uh, in, uh, uh, instigate uh, vaccination. So the flu virus is, a, is an RNA virus. This is a, this is a uh, chemical that is found in your cell. It's found in the nucleus of your cell. And it is a particular type of chemical, which is different from DNA. But nevertheless, uh, we won't dwell too much on that. And as I mentioned to you, you need a living cell and it allows this particular mechanism to evade the immune system. So this is how it works. Fever, cough, nasal congestion, common, but you must remember that you can actually have the flu and be totally asymptomatic. You don't have any symptoms at all. People can walk around perfectly healthy and be having the flu. So these are uh, some of the symptoms that I mentioned to you before. And we go down the route of the COVID uh, virus where you have a much more uh, pronounced fever, usually about 39 degrees Celsius, etc. And that particular fever uh, isn't easily manageable with simple uh, medications such as paracetamol. This doesn't have the effect of the capacity to bring that fever down that easily. The type of cough is often uh, dry, so you don't produce much phlegm or sputum. And in, in uh, more advanced cases, you start to struggle to breathe. You're short of breath and uh, you then uh, become more and more blue because there's not enough uh, oxygen that is circulating with your uh, hemoglobin um, cells. And so they go blue. And uh, eventually your desperation for oxygen increases and then you require admission for oxygen therapy or more. So when do the symptoms appear? Well, classically, they don't appear on the day that you are actually inoculated with the virus. They can occur several days after, maybe possibly two to 14 days after exposure. Uh, uh, then if, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here you have a diagrammatic uh, 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 reproduction of how this virus actually gets into your cell. It's a system of a lock and a key, and so therefore you have to unlock the lock with the key. And so the virus basically uses a particular protein, which is also an enzyme that is found in the cell wall and as it, or the cell membrane. And once it attaches to this particular protein, in this case, it's called ACE2, it triggers the infection. So this is how it works. All right, and what's, what, what, are the, what are the other symptoms that you need to be aware of? Well, in the ear, nose and throat, surgeon uh, manages some of the special senses, and these include the sense of smell, taste, balance, hearing, and um, the sense of smell is a particular sense of smell, uh, is a particular uh, sensation that is commonly uh, lost, even in the common cold or with the flu. But in the case of the COVID-19 virus, we're noticing a lot more patients presenting with a seeming loss of smell that's not necessarily permanent and isn't usually the harbinger of the start of the disease. It often occurs a few days after. So if you notice that your sense of smell is starting to wane or has disappeared, it's worth remembering that this could possibly be secondary to, uh, to the virus. Uh, with the effects of smell come an alteration in taste because when we taste, uh, what taste is really about is the combination of the flavors that go into our nose uh, and our tongue. So it is not just sweet, salty, bitter, uh, and sour, but really also the smell and the odorant particles that give us this capacity to understand what flavor is all about. So if you notice change in the flavor or reduction in flavor or reduction in taste and smell, it's worthwhile remembering that this is, these are the symptoms that COVID-19 can present with. Uh, so New cough, shortness of breath, loss of smell and taste, take it seriously, consider seeing a doctor 
and having an examination in this particular period of time. And the most uh, uh, important thing over here is that uh, earlier detection, earlier um, recognition of this problem can save lives. Uh, if, it needs, if, if needs be, uh, the doctors will decide whether or not you should be on stay at home leave or whether you should be referred on to more specialist treatment. There have been many different types of flu uh, epidemics and pandemics over the years and the ones that have been documented thus far uh, have been from the uh, famous or infamous Spanish flu in 1918 uh, to the SARS uh, a uh, viral uh, pandemic uh, that took place or epidemic that took place in 2003 affected much of South Asia. What we are witnessing is really a pandemic because it's clearly affected more than 2 million people uh, in the world. And these are based on the numbers that have been tested. Uh, these uh, figures and numbers that you see, H1N1, H5N1, etc. These are numbers that are given to particular proteins that are found on the virus uh, on its uh, capsule or capsid, and, and these, these are just ways of defining what type of viral infections are present. In the H1N1 particular virus, it was easily spread, but very few people actually died, whereas the H5N1 spread slowly and was often fatal. So flu can be serious. We know it can be serious. We've already lost several lives in Singapore and, uh, and uh, in the United States currently. Uh, there have been over uh, 20,000 deaths thus far. So it is a very, very serious uh, condition. It affects the elderly. It affects those who are immunocompromised, those with uh, issues with their heart, diabetes, suppressed immune systems, asthma. And so if you happen to have friends or family who are feeling unwell and who also have these comorbidities, these diseases and problems, uh, it's even more important to try and seek specialist opinion quickly. Now the flu does vary, uh, certainly the seasonal flu varies uh, according to the humidity. And this is basically uh, based on uh, uh, studies that have taken place in countries such as Australia. Uh, for instance, this particular graph, you can see that there are different seasons for uh, uh, the flu. Uh, the, uh, you, you have a higher level of flu over December, January, February, and March in countries which are cold in that part of the uh, year. And similarly, so in this particular figure, which is an Australian figure, you see them slightly higher around May, June, July, August, heading towards September, because that's when the Antipodeans tend to have their colder seasons. So um, we'll go to previous slide. And so what happens about Vaccination, does vaccination help? Well, there's no vaccine at the current uh, time for the COVID-19, but um, uh, this, is a, this is a good graph showing patients who've had no flu vaccinations. It's on the, uh, on the screen on the left and uh, over here on the right, those who have had annual flu uh, shots. And you can see that the number of times that they get the flu over 20 years in the group that doesn't have it actually increases that there are several patients you can see who have it twice, thrice, four times, five times when they haven't had a flu vaccination compared to those who have. So it's important to be aware that vaccination does actually reduce the number of times you get the flu over 20 years, but we don't have a vaccine yet for this particular COVID-19. This is based on uh, studies in the National Health Service in Britain uh, where flu uh, influenza virus vaccines are readily available and they're free. 25 million people eligible uh, based on this slide, all primary school children, and it's a, it's a new vaccine. So uh, what do you have to do when you have the flu? Well, cover your, uh, cover your mouth, uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, get some rest if you're unwell. It's basically very important. Uh, antibiotics do not work for the flu, uh, drink plenty of water, and of course, if things get worse, seek specialist medical advice. This graph over here, oh, it's basically a chronological time frame, it shows you the diseases that have uh, taken place right from the Russian influenza flu in 1889, all the way up to uh, 2009, and then now in 2019, 
Uh, and you can see that every so often, the world witnesses another pandemic, which wipes out, sadly, uh, many people. So if you happen to have people who have decent immune systems, uh, you've had vaccines for, common, uh, for the seasonal flu, etc., you make a steady recovery. But people at risk, the elderly, infants, children, people who are immunocompromised, those who are having chemotherapy, et cetera, they, they stand a much worse chance of getting severe complications from this particular disease. Mutant versions of the flu are important to bear in mind. The flu doesn't just remain as it is, it changes. Its RNA, as I mentioned earlier, is a structure that constantly evolves and changes partly to survive, partly to evade the immune system that tries to recognize it. So we may have a COVID-19 uh, infection right now, but it may mutate into something else and the vaccination against it may not work if it is too late and the mutation has already taken place. Uh, from a point of view of ear, nose and throat surgeons, we work very closely in the area of, uh, the, uh, of the nose, which is the first site of transmission and, uh, and infection. And so we are somewhat at risk of picking up COVID-19 and other uh, viral uh, uh, airborne infections. And in this particular period of time, it's important for many of us to gown up, uh, wear the appropriate personal protective equipment, uh, possibly using air purifying respirators when we are dealing in high risk situations and including uh, situations where we are operating in the throat, uh, etc. So these are important um, features of the changes in our lifestyle and in our professional um, profile as ear, nose and throat surgeons because of the COVID-19 infection. We'll go through the nose, a uh, couple of uh, diseases that uh, commonly affect the nose that uh, are close to, but not necessarily related directly with COVID-19. Uh, if you were to look at your nose and take a slice um, through uh, uh, the uh, head uh, in various uh, planes, what you see over here is a picture of uh, a nose that has been sliced straight on. And you'll notice that there's a partition that separates the right side from the left side that is called the septum. And you have projections from the, from the side wall of your nose into the nose. Uh, and this, these projections are called turbinates. If you have to look at it side on, these are turbinates. This is the lower turbinate, this is the middle turbinate, and there's a higher one above. Right on top over here is the nerve that allows us to smell. So you, you know, can imagine that if you were to have an infection, for instance, a cold virus or the flu virus or even an allergy, and as these things enter the nose, they trigger a response, which is called inflammation. And that results in swelling of all these structures over here, which then blocks the nose. So the nose is basically trying to block these particles from getting in lower down into the throat and into the lungs. This is the function of the nose. The nose is trying to protect our lungs, just trying to protect the body. And in so doing, you breathe through your mouth because your nose is blocked. That is that's precisely what happens. As these structures start to swell up, you find it harder to get all those particles that give off smell. For instance, if you were smelling your coffee or you had uh, a, a delicious curry or whatever, and you can't smell it, it's because these structures here have become so swollen that the particles can't get up and trigger a stimulus into the nerve of smell. That's why you lose your sense of smell. So effectively, this is what uh, causes certain uh, changes in your nose. The other things are there's an element of sensitivity and your nose has cells along its lining which release a chemical called histamine that makes the nose itch. And it also causes your nose to sneeze. There's an extremely violent force that is projected from your lungs out through your nose to force out those particles that the nose does not want. And finally, the cells in your nose contain mucus producing 
areas and the mucus that is produced aims to wash or flush the nose of all these particles that you're breathing in. This little picture here shows the side wall of the nose. This is the central partition. And this structure here that you can, most of you can see if you look up your uh, nostrils is the turbinate. So this is the right inferior turbinate. What are the common nasal conditions? Well, allergic rhinitis or allergy is often described as the flu uh, by many patients because they genuinely believe that because their nose feels blocked, itchy, runs, they sneeze, they can't breathe properly through their nose and they're breathing through their mouth, they probably don't sleep very well, that they have the flu. Naturally, these symptoms are quite common with the flu, but they're not the same. They don't have chills or, or, or shivers. They don't have a fever. They don't have the muscle ache every morning. So the morning flu is actually not a flu, but it's actually more than likely an, an aller allergy-driven process. It's allergic rhinitis in the vast majority of cases. And these allergens are called aeroallergens because they are born in the air. And as mentioned earlier, the commonest ones include dust mite, grass, pollen, etc. Some are seasonal and some take place throughout the year. Options to manage allergic rhinitis I'll discuss shortly after. But it's important to be aware that this condition is a condition of the respiratory tract. And the respiratory tract isn't just the nose or isn't just the back of the throat, but it's also the windpipe and the lungs. So this makes up the entire respiratory tract. This is the upper tract, this is the middle, and this is the lower tract. An allergic rhinitis causes all these problems, but is also linked to another condition which many people suffer from in Singapore and the world over called asthma. Asthma is also a, an immune mediated disease, but it affects the lungs. And what it does is it creates the similar sort of process of inflammation, swelling, clogging up of the airway with mucus, etc., and a reduction in the capacity to move air in and out. So allergic rhinitis well treated prevents asthma, and asthma well treated can also reduce the likelihood of allergic rhinitis. Important symptoms, as I mentioned, are congestion, itching, watery or runny nose, and sneezing. 10 to 20 percent of the population in Singapore, possibly even 40 to 50 percent among some groups, uh, suffer from this condition. How do we treat it? Well, the important thing is to work out what you're allergic to, and I would strongly advocate that if you think that you've got this morning flu or allergic rhinitis, to see your doctor and consider at least having a test, uh, be it on your skin or a blood test, to work out what exactly you're allergic to. And perhaps knowing that maybe you can avoid what it is, it's probably the easiest thing to do uh, uh, at the first instance, but it may not work fully. It's very hard to avoid dust. And then of course, if you have pets or plants or particular hobbies that seem to be affecting it, then it'd be worthwhile considering uh, trying to alter your, your lifestyle. And finally, there are treatments. And these treatments over here work in several ways, antihistamines basically stop the release of histamine, which is a protein I was telling you about earlier that causes you to have itching in your eyes and nose. So these, these, uh, can we, these drugs basically try and stop your cells from releasing histamine. Intranasal steroid sprays, uh, steroids tend to have a very bad name. People view them as having uh, a lot of side effects, but these sprays actually contain a minuscule amount of steroid that is destroyed mainly at the lining of the nose and very little is absorbed in the body. Um, by my most patients. So these sprays modulate and reduce the immune reaction uh, that is uh, part and parcel of your allergy. And finally, there are uh, other, uh, other treatments uh, like washing your nose, using salt water, et cetera, to clean the nose, steam. Uh, and then finally, a type of treatment that uh, allows your body to slowly get used to the allergen that it, it's reacting to. And this can be done either by placing a tablet under your tongue or injections under the skin, et cetera. And over time, it takes about two to three years, you become very used to the allergen and you no longer react to it. Surgery does not cure allergy, but what surgery certainly does is that it can improve uh, several features of the allergic reaction. It can actually reduce the swelling and therefore make breathing easier. And it will also help in the 
uh, capacity for you to use your treatment, such as your sprays, and make sure that they can actually get into your nose where they can work. So if you've got an extremely blocked nose and you're using sprays, they're not helping, surgery can help by allowing these sprays to actually enter the nose. The systems of, uh, of surgery vary. This particular treatment called radiofrequency inserts a fork-like uh, set of prongs underneath the lining or mucosa, shrinking the lining and thereby allowing the space in your nose to increase. There are other operations to the sinuses, uh, which uh, in the event that the patient also suffers from uh, chronic uh, sinus problems or acute problems on top of chronic problems uh, can be addressed with surgery. So it's important for those of you out there who have asthma to be aware that many of you may uh, also be suffering from an element of rhinitis or allergic rhinitis that you're probably unaware of or has never been diagnosed for. So it's important to bear in mind that these two conditions actually coexist. So allergic rhinitis increases the risk of asthma by at least three times. And perennial rhinitis or rhinitis that takes place throughout the year is an independent risk factor for asthma. In the British survey, about 27,303 adults with asthma, that's a huge survey, about 17% of them had allergic rhinitis. And the uh, predicted hospitalizations were quite high. They had more GP asthma visits. And of course, the cost of treating their asthma becomes higher if you do not treat the allergic rhinitis. So it's important to treat the allergic rhinitis as well as the asthma. So the nose also influences the chest via similar processes. The nose connects to the chest and the nose works to, to ensure that the chest or the lungs get air that is as clean and filtered as possible, warm enough and humid so that the chest uh, the, or the lungs uh, actually like the air that is being breathed in. So if you have obstruction to the nose, infection, etc., these kind of things will affect the nose. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you can treat rhinitis, you will cut asthma costs. So the United Airways, the nose, the throat, the windpipe and the lungs, do they matter? Well, prevention is better than cure. So if you've got a history of rhinitis, it's an early warning. And di diagnosis of allergic rhin rhinitis uh, is extremely important. So it's worthwhile uh, getting that diagnosed early. Consider the use of steroids. And when I speak of steroids, I'm talking about the intranasal steroids. And also consider using different types of treatments, single therapy, consider using uh, upper and lower respiratory uh, tract. So treat both the upper and lower tract. Consider having joint clinics and guidelines as well. So allergic rhinitis, 85% of patients suffer from nasal congestion. It has a negative impact on your sleep. It affects work. Children don't do so well at school, and that is proven. They have poor concentration. Many of them are also extremely unsettled, and it affects their quality of life. So if you have children with this condition, please seek help, see your GPs, see whether or not you can get some treatment for them. Intranasal steroids are safe, they are recommended, and they are the first line treatment. Antihistamines merely reduce the symptoms of itch and sneezing. They do not have an effect on the actual modulation or treatment of the condition. So intranasal steroids should be considered. And of course, uh, the, the ability of patients to actually stick with their treatment is very, very problematic. Many people uh, start on it and they give up. They expect uh, a cure instantly. These treatments take a while. It takes about four to six weeks to actually see an improvement with intranasal steroid sprays, and they need to be used uh, as, a, as a fairly long-term treatment. They are perfectly safe. Finally, the type of medication you use, the less scent in alcohol, is the less irritating it is to the patient. Now, we'll talk about the ear. The ear consists of three parts. The outer ear, which is the part that sticks out, which is called the pinna. 
and it has a canal which is lined by hair bearing cells over here and cells that produce wax closer to here. For those of you who are unaware, wax is actually a sterile product. It's not dirty. It's certainly cleaner than saliva. It contains no bacteria and it has a function. It protects the ear. It traps uh, particles in the air, infective uh, bugs, etc., and also moves the dry skin as you chew out normally. So you don't actually have to stick cotton buds into your ear to uh, remove the wax. So wax is actually a very useful product. It's produced by the body for a very good reason. The eardrum separates the outer ear from the middle ear and it allows for the transmission of sound by vibration uh, via these three little bones, which are the smallest bones in the human body. And that sends a mechanical signal which moves fluid in this snail-like structure called the cochlea and converts the mechanical movement of the fluid into electrical signals that go, come out via this structure here called the cochlear nerve. So this is how we hear the sound waves move from the ear, to outside the ear, through the ear canal, hit the eardrum, through the three little bones, via this amazing structure that converts mechanical to electrical energy and into your brain, where it's processed as sound. So as I mentioned to you here, this is earwax. And this is a lovely experiment where if you put a little blue dot, or several blue dots on the eardrum, so this is the eardrum over here, you stick a little bit of blue ink. What happens is that as the days and weeks go by, you will see this little spot disperse to various, various parts of the eardrum. And then slowly this blue dot will make its way out, all the way out like so. so the skin of the ear canal is a particularly interesting uh, uh, structure and a design in that it doesn't just shed upwards, but it moves outwards. So the natural tendency for the human body is to clear anything that is produced in this area outwards. You do, therefore, unless you have a particular reason why your ear doesn't cleanse itself normally, you do not need to use cotton buds to remove wax. Pediatric or childhood ear conditions are extremely common and one of the reasons why is because this particular tube that you see here connects the middle ear to your nose. Every time you swallow or yawn, a muscle at the opening of this tube stretches and allows air to flow in and therefore the amount of air pressure here is equal to the air pressure there. In a child, this tube is not as long, nor is it as angled or vertical. It is shorter and flatter. And so what tends to happen is that the back of the nose, which is a source, as we already know, picking up infections, viruses, etc., allergy, can get inflamed. And that tubal opening can get blocked. And mucus from the middle ear finds it hard to flow out through that tube to the back of your nose. So children are quite prone to problems in the ear, certainly babies and young infants. And many of them outgrow these conditions because their face develops, it becomes longer and bigger, and the tube becomes longer and more vertical. And so therefore, the likelihood of them having ear infections or fluid or mucus or what we call glue behind the eardrum uh, becomes less and less. So with children that suffer from these conditions, often after two, three months to six months, many of them just get better, but some of them don't. And you can imagine if you have sound waves going and trying to hit a eardrum, and the eardrum doesn't vibrate because behind it is this huge barrier of mucus or glue, the child cannot hear very well. It's, it's like sticking a finger in your ear, you don't hear very well. And as a result, the child's development is delayed, speech is delayed, and education is delayed. So these are common conditions such as glue ear that we see often. There are conditions that you are born with, which I, uh, I will not go into and uh, because I don't have the time, but congenital uh, uh, conditions are, uh, are many and children are often uh, picked up with issues such as a loss of hearing at birth. And these need to be addressed very quickly 
otherwise the child will lose the capacity to speak. So if you can't hear properly, you don't, can't speak properly, it's very important to, to pick this up early and treat it. And finally, ear infections. The ear infections that I uh, like to mention to you are this one over here. This is an ear infection, but this is an infection that is affecting the outer part of the ear, not the middle ear. So the eardrum is still okay, but you've got all this muck or debris in the outside of the ear. And this is basically not just pus, it's, it's, it's really the protein that is expressed on your skin and in your teeth or in your, uh, or in your nails, sorry, uh, in your hair, it's called keratin. So this is keratin and uh, there may be uh, some infection uh, within this muck over here that needs to be removed. Uh, taking tablets for this sort of ear infection doesn't generally work. The ear is intensely painful, it needs to be cleaned. So we use a special system of a, a hoover or a small type of a sucker. It sucks all this debris out. And once we've cleaned the ear out, then you can apply ear drops. It's important to try and keep the ear dry because it's water and the humidity that causes this to come back again. And in some cases, if this were a bacterial infection and you've dealt a blow to the bacterial infection, but the, but the humidity and the wetness of if the ear persists, it can then become a bacteria, or sorry, a fungal infection, which takes a much longer time to treat. So uh, the first thing we do is we actually uh, we consider the drops. But it's very important, oral toilet, meaning cleaning the ear, giving the patient some painkillers and giving them drops. That's very, very important. Okay, so here you have a child and what has happened is that the tube that connects the ear to the nose is blocked and the, and the mucus in the middle ear is now got infected possibly by the bacteria or the viruses that have moved up from the eustachian tube, which is the tube connecting the ear to the nose. And now this, this poor child is in agony because the swelling in the middle ear uh, is causing such pain. Uh, there are several things that can happen in this particular condition. It can actually get better on its own if the tube uh, uh, connecting the ear to the nose actually resolves in its swelling and the mucus and the pus can drain down, or it can burst through the eardrum. So it has a small tear and the pus comes out and the, and the pressure is relieved and the child feels better. Uh, but of course, now you have a discharging ear with a small perforation. And finally, uh, there are worse complications where this infection can then go upwards towards the brain uh, and uh, cause an abscess or it can go into the inner ear and also affect the hearing and um, damage the ear uh, irreversibly. So it's important to bear in mind that these conditions, if they're not getting better, ought to be seen by someone with a special interest in ear, nose and throat surgery. Start off with your general practitioner, of course. And then conditions in the adults, like in children, you get infections in the uh, external ear, but middle ear infections in adults are actually quite rare. And the reason for that is because the tube, as I mentioned earlier, is well developed. So if, if adults tend to have middle ear infections, it would be worthwhile considering other potential causes, which can be even uh, quite sinister or dangerous, such as cancer of the back of the nose, which we see more commonly amongst the south, southern Chinese races in the world. So if an adult comes in with what is thought to be glue ear or middle ear infection or middle ear fluid, it's paramount that this person is seen by an ENT surgeon and assessed and possibly uh, had a, had a uh, tube or a scope or camera put into the nose to make sure that there isn't anything lurking at the back of the nose where this tube communicates and is blocking that particular communication. So the middle ear infections, as I mentioned to you, are rare. Inner ear infections tend to either affect the nerve of balance, which is this particular nerve here, or the nerve of hearing, or both. Uh, if it affects the nerve of balance, uh, often the patient presents with severe dizziness or vertigo. It can be so bad that they feel that the entire world is collapsing on them. They can't walk, their eyes can't see straight, everything is spinning. They feel extremely nauseous. And this is a condition known as labyrinthitis or Neuro vestibular neuronitis if it purely affects this nerve, which is called a vestibular nerve. If you have uh, an infection, viral, uh, commonly, that uh, causes the particular patient to suddenly feel, hey, I've lost my hearing or I don't hear very well. It's not because of wax. It's not because of middle ear fluid. 
this is an emergency, it needs to be seen, uh, hearing tests needs to be done, and treatment in the form of, of uh, steroids uh, to reduce the inflammation of the nerve ought to be advocated as soon as possible. So this particular condition, uh, which is known as a sudden sensory neural hearing loss, is an emergency in the ear, nose, and throat context. And so if you happen to feel that your hearing has suddenly dropped, you can't explain why it's not, and the doctor doesn't see any wax, etc. It could potentially be this condition, and it needs to be identified early and treated quickly. Uh, and of course, you can you, you can damage your ear from trauma. It can be uh, from flying or diving or even from physical injury. So what you see over here is a cochlear implant. It's a particular type of hearing aid. In patients who have lost the capacity to hear from their inner ear, it's quite severe. Uh, hearing aids, ordinary hearing aids, will not be able to allow them to hear. So what we do is we uh, perform surgery and we place special electric wires stimulate the nerve of hearing. So this is a more specialist type of treatment for patients with sensory neural hearing loss that cannot be uh, remedied with a normal hearing aid. So there are other types of hearing aids and other forms of treatment for hearing loss. Vertigo, as I mentioned to you, is, is a type of dizziness, but the term dizziness is, is quite amorphous. We tend to use the word vertigo, which means that there's actually a rotation either of the individual or of the environment that the individual happens to be in. So when is it the ear? When is dizziness the ear? Well, if, if you actually feel a spinning and the room is spinning and you uh, 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 clearly describe this sort of symptom, uh, then it is possibly or potentially the ear. Uh, unsteadiness is... is and, uh, and imbalance, grogginess, and uh, feeling of drunkenness may not be the ear. These conditions or these symptoms can be related to conditions associated with the heart, blood pressure, uh, and also migraine if it's associated with a headache. So not all balance issues are the ear, uh, and it's worthwhile also considering, certainly in the elderly, issues that may be associated with weakening of vision, uh, and other uh, issues to do with blood pressure or their heart, etc. So what are the uh, inner ear conditions that are related to vertigo? Well, this is a bit of a mouthful, but it's called benign postural paroxysmal vertigo. And what it basically means is that uh, when, the, when the individual lies down or turns their head while they're lying down to a particular side, they get this sudden feeling of spinning and it lasts several seconds and then it just dies off and it goes. It's not associated with nausea, it's not associated with headaches, and it's quite self-limiting. So that is basically a condition that is related to the inner ear and particles in the part of an inner ear which resemble little sand grains or, or crystals of salt which move into the little areas over here of the semicircular canal. So they move from the semicircular canal and these are the shifted crystals. These other two conditions, Meniere's disease, which is seen more commonly in younger women, but also affects men, is a condition that is related with a feeling of a very full ear, your ear feels full or blocked. Uh, you get a ringing sound that is called tinnitus. You get a fluctuating hearing loss, often with your low frequencies, and you get vertigo. And as I mentioned to you earlier, acute labyrinthitis or vestibular neuronitis. Moving swiftly on to the throat. Well, this is the back of the mouth and this is the back of the mouth or the oral cavity leads into what we call the oropharynx or the part of the throat that can be seen through the mouth. These two big bulges over here are not abnormal. They're called the tonsils by lay people or palatine tonsils because they're related to the soft palate. And this little thing that dangles at the back of your throat is your uvula. Often it, 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 it vibrates um, uh, when you breathe through your mouth while you're sleeping and that causes the noise that is related to snoring as does the soft palate and in some patients, um, the, the tonsils. So the back of the throat uh, can also be affected, can be affected by viruses. In fact, they're more commonly affected by viruses than bacteria. Often when people have sore throats, these infections are viral infections. And, uh, and so not necessarily get better if you give them antibiotics. 
So uh, the back of the throat is also known as the pharynx or the oropharynx. And in this particular case, you can see an exudate or a, 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 a bit of uh, yellowish uh, lining over the tonsil, which may be related to pus. You can see some pus over here as well, which is the yellowish stuff up there. Many patients uh, also come uh, and see us with yellow spots or, or crystals or, or grains, which are stuck in the crypts or these little holes in the tonsil. These are known as tonsil stones or the fancy term is a tonsillolith or crypt debris. Uh, they, are, they are harmless on the whole, although in some cases they can set off a local inflammatory reaction causing a, a sore throat or a chronic feeling of a sore throat. But they can also uh, smell or, or break down and release uh, bad odors and maybe related to uh, bad breath or halitosis. So patients do come uh, and see us for that. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, you've got snoring, which is another condition that we see, which is associated with the nose and the throat. Uh, often men start younger uh, as snorers and they generally are very bad, so they don't get worse, although they can. But women start later, usually around the menopause, uh, with all the physiological changes that take place, and they can also hit the high decibels with time. There are other aspects that affect uh, the people who have problems with their sleep. Sometimes they choke in their sleep or they drool, talk, walk, spin about, etc. It's worthwhile just being aware that this, these are not normal uh, situations. They need to be uh, uh, looked at and perhaps um, assessed by an ENT surgeon or a sleep physician. So many people have problems with sleep, both in America and Singapore. And you notice that the Center for Disease Control Survey says that many, many adults uh, who respond to surveys talk about having less than seven hours, hours of sleep, many more than up to 50% snore, 38% fall asleep during the day at least once. And up to about 5% even fall asleep while they're driving. There are three different types of events that take place with snoring. One is when you completely stop breathing, which is apnea. The other is when you reduce the level of, 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 of breathing, which is hypopnea. And the final uh, um, uh, event is called a respiratory effort related arousal or RERA. And this is where the patient effectively uh, isn't apneic or hypopneic, but starts to start breathing more heavily to try and improve their oxygenation. This can, be, this can be identified by performing what we call a sleep study, where we basically analyze how you sleep by placing certain monitors on you. So you have snorers, you have people with upper airway resistance syndrome, and finally obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. And this is effectively the spectrum of disease. We have different grades, mild, moderate, and severe, which I don't have very much time to talk about. And this was the original sleep study. You can imagine how anyone can sleep with this. I can't, but anyway, there you go. But these are the new devices to perform sleep studies with. So what do we do? Well, we try and get people to lose weight, sleep on, uh, sleep on their sides, etc. Perhaps even consider ways of trying to get them to breathe better, uh, move their jaw forward, and potentially consider surgery. So this, these are little balls that you can place on your, uh, this is an exaggeration obviously, but you can place them on your back. And then when you sleep, it kind of makes you roll over from your back to your side because people tend to sleep and snore more um, on their backs. These are, uh, these are devices that are made to try and lift your lower jaw forward and thereby move your tongue out of the way. So your tongue is over here. If you can push your tongue out of the way, it doesn't drop backwards and you can get air in and breathe better. Continuous positive airway pressure is a type of treatment. You attach this mask either to your nose or to your mouth or to both, and it pumps a pressurized air through to try and force air open, preventing these structures, which is your tongue and your palate, from dropping down and constricting your airway and restricting your capacity to breathe. So there are many patients who have tried this, many of whom use it and many of whom who don't. And for those who don't uh, and would, uh, would like to consider other alternatives, we offer them different types of uh, treatments in the form of surgery. But prior to that, we do other diagnostic tests such as a sleep nasendoscopy where we put them to sleep and 
watch them uh, sleep and snore and analyze which are the parts of their airway that are affected when they're snoring and tailor the treatment accordingly. So these are the types of treatments that we can perform. This, this is the tonsil here, this is the nose, this is the soft palate, so the tonsils can be treated and removed if they're very big, etc. And surgery to the palate, there are many types of surgery to try and stiffen the palate, reduce its uh, uh, pliancy so it doesn't vibrate as much, certainly for snoring. And in certain cases, we reduce the uh, size of the palate so that you can breathe better. And finally, the back of the tongue can be treated in various ways, uh, less invasive ways, such as using a type of treatment called radio frequency, but there are more invasive ways using surgery, either uh, with lasers or with robots or um, other devices. So that's, I've come to the end of the talk. Thank you ever so much for your attention and for tuning in. I hope that you found this uh, useful and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions. Uh, so please feel free to ask anything that you uh, think you'd like to. Uh, All right, thank you, Doc. Verified, yeah. I think it was a very informative session. Um, we'll have questions now. I'll start off with the first question, give me a minute. Hi, Doc. Um, this is a patient from Indonesia. I've been having vertigo fits for two weeks now. Not very bad, but it occurs whenever I lay down and look to the left and when getting up from that position. How can I remedy this condition and what medication shall I take? It's a 34-year-old from Indonesia. Okay. So, um, uh, just based on the history that you provided, it's a very good uh, summary of your symptoms. Um, it sounds very much like this may be related to uh, those grains or those crystals that I mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, they happen to be in the inner ear and for reasons that we don't fully understand, it may have been an infective process in the past or trauma uh, or, or completely uh, idiopathic. That means we have, we have no, we have no reason, uh, we, we can't give you a reason why they have dislodged. But these little particles then move from a particular part of your inner ear into the semicircular canal and cause a, a sensation of movement of the fluid in the semicircular canal that triggers this, this uh, dizziness or vertigo that you describe. If it happens to be affecting a particular ear, that means you say you turn to the left and it causes it, then my advice to you is to see a ear, nose and throat surgeon uh, to perhaps consider a first in exam, taking history, examining you, but more importantly, assuming that this is benign proxismal positional vertigo, which I think it is, it sounds very much like it, then to consider doing a test, uh, which is called a dix holpike test, where we actually recreate your symptoms by getting you to lie flat and turning your head. So you, we make you dizzy in the, in the clinic. Don't be scared. It's part of the treatment. And then what we do thereafter is having proven that this is indeed the problem, we reverse it by twisting your head in the opposite direction for a while. And then a, a series of maneuvers, moving you and your body around so that we can try and stick those crystals back into the place that they belong. So that would be my advice to you. Don't fret. It sounds like benign proxismal positional vertigo or BPPV. It's called benign for a good reason. So get it sorted out. See someone. You can Google search it. You can even watch how to do Dix Hall Pikes and Epley's on, on YouTube and all these other uh, things that we have these days. But my feeling on the matter is go see an ENT surgeon and I'm sure they'd be able to help you. Um, Sandy, you can always call us in for a video consult with Dr. Vyas and maybe yes, yes, can yes. assist you. Media consult, that. no yeah. problem. You can do we that too. Call us in Happy tomorrow, to we're do operational it. tomorrow, tomorrow morning from 10 a.m. onwards. You have our clinic number, so you give us a call, yeah? We'll take the next question, Doc. Um, face mask is mandatory now, but it's causing a lot of nasal congestion, dry throats. What do we do about it? Okay, well... Uh, that's, uh, that's sadly a part and parcel of A, uh, having to wear, uh, assuming that you're wearing a face mask for uh, quite a long time, you're struggling to breathe, you're breathing through your mouth, you're probably not used to having this um, fabric or whatever uh, blocking what you would normally breathe through, which is your nose. 
it's difficult. Uh, you could you, you could every so often give your nose a break if you have that potential. Uh, drink more water. I, 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 it, it, the, the difficulty is that you, you ought to be trying your best not to be wearing the face mask when you don't need to. And if you have to, then you have no choice. I, I believe that the rules have become extremely strict. You can't walk out uh, of your house without one unless you're doing uh, vigorous exercise, uh, etc. So you'll have to work around it. I'm very sorry, I, 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 it's a struggle. Uh, I believe that the face masks that the government of Singapore has uh, given out are cloth face masks, uh, they're different types. Uh, I can well imagine how you feel, but uh, we wear the N95s, which are even more irritating and difficult and we, we have to wear them when we operate. And that can be for hours on end. And so we're all, we're all suffering. I, I, I understand, I feel for you. Uh, but you have to find a way around it. So uh, if you can, take a break, take it off, drink some water. Uh, if you want to, you can use some douches for your nose or there, there are plenty of products which you can use to just moisten your nose. But th there's very little else you can do. I'm very sorry. All right, thanks, Doc. I think, um, thank you for that. At least you're more reassured that they can do things to alleviate all their side effects from wearing the mask too long. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, it was a pleasant evening and we, ha we had Dr. Diaz, our ENT head and neck surgeon for you. Uh, we have more sessions coming up, but it was a good evening and I hope all of y'all are well informed. Stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you again soon. Good night, folks. <laughs>